Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live right here on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. Great to be back. I am John Schmelk, joined by Paul Dottino. The phone number for you is 201-939-4513. Today, we begin our team opponent previews, which we do leading up to the training camp portion of our summer. Uh, we're going to kind of go in the order in which the Giants are playing their opponents, except we're going to leave the... NFC East teams for last. So uh, we're going to get to the Cardinals a little bit later in the week. We're going to start off with the San Francisco 49ers today. Uh, we'll get a lowdown on what's going on in San Fran. Then we'll take your calls at 201-939-4513. Paul, how was your weekend? Uh, wet. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. It was kind of off and on over the weekend. Saturday morning was bad, and then we had the one storm yesterday in the afternoon. And this morning, of course, too. Well, yes. And if it wasn't for that to get you wet enough, how about the humidity yesterday? Well, what happens is that after the ground gets wet and it gets hot, then it evaporates and you feel like you're in a bit of a steam. And bath. folks, if you're in the New York metropolitan area, man, did you bake yesterday. I did my five. Actually, I did eight yesterday, and I felt like a potato, baked potato by the time I got home. Well, my daughter and I started doing it on the weekend. She'll take her scooter, and I'll go with her, and I'll run three miles oh. as she scoots. So we did that around 5 o'clock yesterday in the afternoon, and it was, uh, it was steamy. It was, it was worse steep. in the morning, trust me. Hopefully they have much better weather out there in the Bay Area, where we're joined by Jennifer Lee Chan. She covers the 49ers for NBC Sports out there. Jennifer, you got John Schmelk and Paul Dottino right here. Oh, oh that's not her? Okay, I, I, I thought she was on the line. I'm not going to the calls yet. Dom, get her up, please. Thank you. I saw you to call up. I assume that was her. No worries. 201-939-4513. I didn't look at the document. That's my fault. Full start. I just, assumed, I just assumed Dom was getting the guest on <laughs> before he got Sal on. I'm, I'm just messing with you, Dom. It's all good. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, it was it was hot over the weekend. And now we're this is a slow period, Paul. Minicamp's yeah. over. Uh, there's really nothing else to react to. We have the Saquon deadline in a few weeks. Other than that, there's really not going to be much until that last week of July no. when the guys are here for training camp. You know what I noticed, John, when I was looking out at the fields today? A lot of brown in that grass. Oh, it, has, it hasn't rained in like three weeks. We we really need this rain, which is the which is the flip side of us being miserable that we don't like it. The bottom line is those those practice fields right now they're t they're getting scorched. So so these next two, three days of rain or whatever it is will definitely help. Yeah, and hopefully there's better weather out there in the Bay Area. And we'll find out from Jennifer Lee Chan. She covers the San Francisco 49ers for NBC Sports, NBC Sports in the Bay Area. Jennifer, you got John Schmelk and Paul Dottino here in rainy East Rutherford, New Jersey. How you doing out there? <laughs> I'm good. How are you guys doing? Uh, we're doing great. As Paul and I were just talking about, this is kind of like slow time for the NFL. Not a whole lot new going on. I noticed you were at, um, I believe, uh, George Kittle's uh, tight end university, right? Uh, uh, a couple days ago covering that. So what are you kind of keeping your eyes on in terms of the 49ers over the next couple months leading into training camp? What are some of the news items that you're watching that is kind of yet to be determined heading into the 2023 season? I mean, I think the biggest question of all is the quarterback situation, whether Trey Lance is going to be the number two, whether Brock Purdy is going to be ready to be number one. Um, Sam Darnold's been there adjusting to Kyle Shanahan's offensive system. So, I mean, the quarterback situation is always the most pertinent to talk about when you talk about the 49ers. All right. Well, then give us uh, your crystal ball look. How will you predict <laughs> it's going to shake out? Look, we've seen enough of Sam Donald here in New York. I know that you're a USC. I get it. I get it. All right. I understand that. I'm telling you, Sam Donald is not going to cut it too well for them. Just you wait until Kyle Shanahan gets his hands on that guy, Paul. I'm yeah. telling you, don't Sh be surprised. Shanahan's a magician. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm thinking, and I'm not a Trey Lance guy either, uh, Jennifer. i got to be honest with you. What is he throwing? 400-something passes uh, between college and pro in his career. Uh, obviously, he's as green as celery. I think Purdy's your best bet out there, but we don't know where his – his uh, UCL stands. Why don't you update us on that injury first and then tell us who you think the best quarterback is for this team? I mean, you're looking at just playing experience. Brock Purdy has had the most successful run out of all the quarterbacks in that room. Now, whether he's going to be ready or not, it remains to be seen. Schedule-wise, he's on track to be ready maybe like a week before week one, you know, uh, would they open up the season? Uh, I talked to Nick Mullins, who oddly has the same surgery as Brock Purdy did, and he said, you know, it just took a while. It took a while for, you know, for him to have confidence in his elbow. I think that's the same with any player with a major injury on their body. You talk to ACL guys, and it takes them a while to make sure they have confidence in that knee that it's not going to happen to them again. So 
Uh, Nick Mullen said he worked on his, you know, mental strength along with his elbow strength. So he looks like he's back to 100%. You know, he's the backup for the Minnesota Vikings. He was on the 49ers roster mm-hmm. when he had the same injury. So, you know, if, if Brock Purdy can go through the same recovery timeline-wise as Nick Mullins, he should be ready for week one. But, you know, how will he react? He is a preparation junkie, so there is that. But, you know, you never know how a guy is going to come back from a major injury like that, whether he's going to be confident, he's going to play, you know, a little more reserved, or is he going to play like himself? Um, And as far as Sam Darnold and Trey Lance, I think both those guys just haven't had a real good opportunity to be on the field with a team like the 49ers. So if you put both of them in the situation with, you know, a lot of star players around them, I mean, you you were mentioning George Kittle, you've got Christian McCaffrey. I mean, so many star players on that roster. So to have that supporting cast there for them, I think they both would have a better shot at what they've had in the past. Trey Lance just unfortunately has not had a lot of time on the field because he's been injured. I talked to him at tight end you and he said, finally, he's happy because he's healthy. And I think that makes a big difference in a guy on the field. Where do you think the team stands with Trey Lance? Obviously, to your point, we haven't seen him on the field. The team has seen him more in practice than we have, obviously, uh, though these injuries has limited his time on the practice field, too. You know, where's the confidence level for a guy that they did trade up to get high in the draft just a couple years ago? Is there still a lot of development? Are they happy with what he's shown behind the scenes? What are you hearing about what they have seen from Trey Lance, at least in the meetings, even if he hasn't been able to do that on the field? I think they really like him. You know, he's a guy who's been around a lot when he's been injured. Um, I think that as far as a locker room guy, he's a great guy. So Brian Greasy is the quarterback's coach. I spoke to him, you know, during our assistant coach's availability. And he said, you know, I have a lot of respect for Trey Lance because he stayed around. He was very involved. He was in all the meetings that he could be when he was, even when he was injured. And they really had to get him back to his original throwing motion because he – broke his finger in the preseason of 2021. So that changed his entire throwing motion. Then at week two, 2022, he broke a bone in his foot. He had to have a subsequent surgery to have the pins taken out. So, I mean, the guy has dealt with so many injuries. So now they've really worked on his throwing motion. He was working with Jeff Christensen during the off season to kind of get back to throwing the right way because he couldn't actually straighten his index finger on his throwing hand throughout the entire 2022 season. So that changes the way you can release a ball. Yeah, it's a problem. So, <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit. So he was releasing with his middle finger being the last thing to touch the football, which changes the way you have to throw the ball. So now with him being physically 100%, he's getting back to kind of the basics, and now he's feeling much more confident and happy on the field. All right, so let's just talk about this for a second. It's week three when the Giants play the 49ers on September the Mm -hmm. 21st. Okay, that's actually out there on the West Coast. Is it your opinion that they think Purdy knows enough about the offense after the success that he had last year when he won six in a row? And even though he got hurt and may not even be healthy enough to get back into the flow until maybe a week before opening day, would they still take a flyer on him being the week one quarterback? Or do you get the feeling that their stomach would not be able to digest that and they're really going to give Donald or Lance a chance to open the season as the starter until Purdy literally has enough reps to get melted back into the system? I think it all depends on how he's going, you know, how he's looking in practice and training camp through those first, I mean, that last week before the season opener. So if he can play up to his full potential the week before the season opener, I think it's definitely his job to lose. I mean, that's what everybody has said. That's what John Lynch has said. That's what Kyle Shanahan has said. So it just depends on his recovery, if he can do everything in practice that week before week one. If he can't, then I see, you know, whoever it is, they're going to battle it out between Trey Lance and Sam Darnold. And whoever wins that battle, I think, will be there until Brock Purdy is fully healthy, if that is the case. But as of right now, from what we're hearing, Brock Purdy is on the schedule. He's the guy that is the, quote, leader in the clubhouse. So he's the one who got the job if he's healthy and ready to go. Uh, last one on the on the quarterback, Jennifer, real quick. The impression of Sam Darnold in terms of what they saw in the spring during OTAs and minicamp? I think he looked great. I think it's going to take a little while for him to get used to the offense. But, again, you know, this is a guy who has not had a great supporting cast around him. He kind of did the same thing at USC. He I think it, I, what I equate it to is kind of playing hero ball where he puts the entire team and the yeah. game on his shoulders. So then he's trying to force passes. Now, he's not going to have to do that as much when you've got Christian McCaffrey, George Kittle, Kyle Juszczyk, Debo, and Brandon Ayuk there. So when he's got that 
supporting cast, he's not going to have to force throws as much. So I would expect that if he was, to, you know, get more reps as, under center for the 49ers, I think there'll be less interceptions than what you've seen from him in the past. Let's stick with the offense here for a second. Uh, John can tell you I was a huge George Kittle guy coming out of school. In each of the last three years, he's had less than 100 targets after having more than 100 targets in back-to-back seasons where he was the focal point of that offense. And a lot of injuries, too, last couple but, of years. Yeah, mm-hmm. but now McCaffrey, you know, Ayuk, Debo, you know, we talk about all the different weaponry that they have. Is his role in this offense lessened because of all the other talent around him? Or do we expect him to go back to being the focal point of the offense as he was a couple of years ago? I think they're all going to have to share the spotlight. I think what's happened in the past, you look at that one year where Debo Samuel had 1,400 yards of receiving. That was because he was the offense. So because of a result of injuries to all the different star players, it was him only. Uh, I think George Kittle, when he had his all-pro year, I think that was also the reason why. Because, you know, when attrition happens throughout the season, the guys, the last guys left standing are the ones that Kyle Shanahan's going to rely on. So if it is the fact, if they get lucky enough to have all those guys healthy as the season runs on, I think it's going to be spread out pretty evenly. And Kyle Shanahan tends to go with the hot hand. So whoever is really stepping up their game, I think that's the guy who's going to get most of the play calling. And you see it kind of at the end of the 2022 season. George Kittle was the one who was out there a lot on the field. Mm -hmm. Debo Samuel dealt with some injuries. I think Brandon Ayuk is going to be the top wide receiver with the top receiving yards, but I do think George Kittle is going to have a huge role in the offense as usual. Last one on the offense for me, Jennifer. Christian McCaffrey is someone they had to integrate into the offense midway through last year. Do you feel like there's a lot of meat left on this bone now that Shanahan's had a chance to go into this offseason with a whole (laughs) offseason to game plan for a player with such a unique skill set like McCaffrey? Absolutely, and I think it's more on Christian McCaffrey than on Kyle Shanahan. Uh, Kyle spoke to us kind of during one of the owners' meetings, and he said, you know, everyone's like, oh, you can be so much more creative now that you have Christian McCaffrey, and he said, really, that's not the case. It's just, you know, he can be actually more simplified because he knows that Christian McCaffrey is going to be there making those plays. Now, McCaffrey at OTAs, you don't see a lot of star veterans going in there and really running full speed, but he was. I mean, he was looking midseason for him. He's healthy. I think he's really excited to have an entire offseason to prepare. So I would expect big things from him this coming season. All right. I'm going to flop at the defense. I'm going to skip the offensive line, which I don't usually do. But because, Jennifer, <laughs> I'm sure your your time is limited. So there's enough to talk about with this outstanding 49ers defense, which gave up, what, 17 points a game last year. But they've got to change. D'Amico Ryan's not there anymore. Steve Wilkes now in charge. And this guy specializes in man coverage in the secondary. How is this going to change things for San Fran? Well, it's a really young secondary, so I think it's going to really help them a lot. Um, One of the guys, Diamador Lenore, already spoke to us about how he's taught him different techniques about how to watch the chest plate of the receiver that he's defending and how that really allows him to trust himself more and be able to really keep the eye on his eye on the ball. I think the biggest change, though, for the 49ers defense is Javon Hargrave. I'm sure you're familiar mm-hmm. with him. And being in the center of that defensive line, I think it's going to make a big difference. I think it's going to open up Nick Bosa to be able to do a lot more this season than he did last season. And last season, he was pretty good. Yeah. How much do you think the scheme is going to change, Jennifer, from last year to this year? Is he going to implement a whole new system? Is he going to try to work a lot with what they did last year and just tweak it? Has there been a lot of discussions about how much that defensive system is going to change? Because, frankly, they've had so much success under Ryan's, you wonder how much you really do want to switch up. Yeah, I mean, they've been really lucky with their defensive corners, you know, um, and I think that Steve Wilkes has come in and said, you know, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So he's going to add some of his own little pieces to, I think, what the secondary does. But I think what's really worked for the 49ers is a defensive line that just goes after the quarterback and gets them. You look at, you know, the middle of the field. You've got Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw. Those guys really can cover. I think he may, you know, design some more blitzes for them. I think Fred Warner is so versatile. Being able to use him in every possible way, I think, is going to be something that Steve Wilkes is going to be looking to do. I'm very intrigued by Drake Jackson, Jennifer, because I remember being at the Combine, and I know he was a second-round pick, but there was a lot of feeling that he might wind up being a boomer bust guy. What has he shown San Francisco to this point? What is his upside? Because I think if, if he really turns out to be on the plus side of the ledger, 
that makes a, an outstanding defense even more devastating. Yeah, he's one of those guys, and you hear about it a lot when rookies come out, that they don't realize how long and how grueling an NFL season is. You know, you, you the guys go through college, they play maybe 12 games at the most. When you're a rookie, they want you to play in the preseason. You've got a 17-game slate now, so that's 20 games. And then the Niners go deep into the postseason. His body really wasn't ready for, I think, the rigors of the NFL. Now, he's been at the facility throughout the offseason working out a lot. He's already put on, I believe, 13 pounds of muscle weight. He's been working mm-hmm. with Chris Kacarek, the defensive line coach. I think they have big expectations for him coming up this season. I think that, you know, when you look at rookies that come out, there are very few that immediately have a huge impact. Sure. And, you know, it's, it's guys like Nick Bosa, the freaks that are absolutely physically fit coming out of their, you know, that preparation for the draft, for pro days, the travel that it comes with, you know, getting ready to go to a new team. And then learning this game. So I think Drake Jackson is set up for success this year, but it's really on his shoulders to be a lot better. Uh, final question for me, Jennifer. NFC West, I got to imagine the Rams are going to bounce back a little bit if Matthew Stafford's healthy. The Cardinals, I think we all know, are going to have a down year. The Seahawks came out, had a nice little season last year. How do you see this NFC West shaping up? I think Seattle looks like they're the ones on the rise. I mean, Geno Smith is going to have another season as a starter, and they – I mean, I think they always draft well. Pete Carroll has, you know, great college connections, and he really does a good job. They've added to their wide receiver group, and he's a defensive guy. So I know he's, you know, got new toys in his chest to play with on the field. Um, I think Seattle is the, the team that's going to really give 49ers a challenge, and they always do. Uh, yeah, and you're right. I think the Rams are going to bounce back. I don't think they're going to be as bad as last season. They really were devastated, especially on the offensive line, which led to Matt Stafford not being as healthy. Uh, but I think they're always a good team for the foreigners to match up with, especially when you look at you know the coaching rivalry there yeah. uh, with mm-hmm. McVay and Kyle Shanahan. They just, I think, during the season they hate each other. I think they have, you know, it's that you know older brother, younger brother <laughs> love hate relationship. Um, but yeah, I think the Arizona Cardinals are still going to be a little bit of a mess for a while. Yeah, Jennifer, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your time off this summer, and we'll catch up with you in September. Stay well. Thank. That sounds great. Thanks so much. That's Jennifer Lee Chan. She covers the 49ers for NBC Sports Bay Area. Uh, their 49ers beat writer, USC alum. Paul, here's the thing, and we'll get to your calls in a second at 201-939-4513. I mean, the 49ers and the Eagles are the two most talented teams in the conference. Yes. I mean, you look at the 49ers defense, uh, to me, it's it's them in Dallas. Either one of those two teams are going to have the best defense in the conference. They're both excellent. And you do worry about the Niners' secondary, though. That's the one thing you look at. And D'Amico Rounds was able to scheme around that a little bit because their front is just so dominant. Nick Bosa is a top three pass rusher in the league. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have they just add Hargrave. You mentioned Drake Jackson. You have a great middle linebacker in Fred Warner. They're just really, really good up front. You know, all defensive coordinators will tell you it will still always start with stopping the run. Well, they can do that really well. And in addition to that, they can absolutely bludgeon any quarterback that they want to. Uh, it's a devastating front seven. It really is. Philadelphia has, you know, a very difficult front to deal with as well. That That's another one of those teams that, that they can do a lot of damage to you. Uh, I don't think they, they play the run quite as well, obviously. But when you have that front seven that can do both of those things, you can kind of get away with a little bit in the back end. You know, John? And And I will say this. Last year, the Niners, I looked up the number before we had the start of the show. They had 20 interceptions, which is a big, juicy number. Now, they played a ton of zone. They're not going to do that this well, year. Well, that's why I asked Jennifer how much they're going to change their schemes in the second I think they will. It's only natural when you hire a guy. A young, inexperienced secondary that has to play man a lot is a dangerous proposition. It, it is, but that's what Wilkes does. He's known for playing a lot more man. I know. So I can't imagine that they would have hired him unless they were going to let him at least put some of his thumbprint on the team. I mean, you you don't hire the guy then if if that's mm-hmm. not what you want to do. You wouldn't think. So so I'm going to wonder if the one area that they may take a step back is forcing takeaways. I'm I could see they may not get as many takeaways as they have had, you know, last year, and and that helped them to become incredibly dominant. 
that's probably the only place I see them taking a step back. Yeah, and look, health too. Health of the 49ers is always an issue. You look at yeah. their players on offense specifically, George Kittle, consistent injury issues. Debo Samuel, fairly consistent injury issues. Mm-hmm. Christian McCaffrey had two years where he played less than five games. Don't forget Elijah Mitchell. Who's the who's backup also running back all the time? He's missed half his games so far then, because of a knee. And then look, we spent half that interview on the quarterbacks because it's so important. I understand why we I did know. it. We had to. That's an injury problem too, right? Mm-hmm. And it sure sounds like, based on what Jennifer said, that Brock Purdy, barring a setback or an additional injury, will be the quarterback in week three, and he will probably have started weeks one and two as well. Again, as long as he's healthy to do it. I think we should caution ourselves. Several years ago, the Niners came into MetLife Stadium to play the Giants, and they were ravaged. Yeah. Ravaged. Now, that was in November. And they destroyed the Giants. C.J. Beathard, right? Yeah. So, you warned me all day. Paul, don't. Calm down. Calm down. (laughs) Oh, wait. That was one of those pregames where you all jazzed up? That was one of those (laughs) pregames where I was exceptionally (laughs) pleased with the opponent that they were going to play. Yeah. Wasn't it like 44 to 10 or something like that? It was an absolute munching. And and they must have been missing like six starters. I mean, it was... was, No, no, they were banged up. They were banged up. And Mm -hmm. they walked all over the Giants. Look, they're very well coached. Kyle Shanahan is the best offensive coach in football. We should have talked to him probably more about that, but he's just phenomenal. I don't know how much we're going to... We know what he is. I don't know how much else we're going to say about it. Absolutely. (laughs) And But look, they do have a lot of guys that are played by injuries on offense. So, But again, you're getting them early in the year. So... Odds week are, three. You're, they're going to be fairly healthy. So. Week three. And that's going to be a Thursday night game, by the way, off the short week. They're going to stay out on the West Coast from Arizona mm-hmm. uh, to San Francisco. So, unique game. My hope, my hope for that game, because really you're only two and a half weeks into the season, not three, because yeah. it is a Thursday game. Mm-hmm. My hope would be from the Giants' perspective, and I'm not talking for the coaching staff, I'm talking for me. I hope that Donald or Lance are playing that game instead of Brock Purdy. I I like Brock Purdy's poise. I thought what he did last year was for real. I don't think he's a flash in the pan, John. I think he's pretty good. Okay. I, I need to see more. I do need to see more, but I suspect he's better rather than worse. And I know what Donald is. I'm never – look, Lance, maybe after he plays 20 or 30 NFL games, I'll start to come around, but – at this point, I'm not sold on him either. Well, oh, he can't be. He hasn't done enough. And look, Sam right. Darnold is what he is. I mean, at this point, he's not going to develop into like a Pro Bowl quarterback or whatever. But I will say this. I think if the Niners, let me put it this way. If the Niners were forced to play Sam Darnold for 17 games, they would still be in the playoffs and Sam Darnold might make a Pro Bowl. <laughs> yeah, the Shanahan factor, Because right? of Shanahan. Oh, yeah. And I'm not saying Sam Darnold's to become this whole brand new player and be some kind of superstar. And the ridiculous it's weaponry they it, have, too. I mean, look what Nick Mullins and C.J. Beathard did with that offense. Yes. I mean, yes. but Darnold's better than they are. I know. They could bring back Steve Spurrier and John Brody. I mean, Jennifer made the point, right? You you know, you throw like five-yard passes to Debo Samuel, Christian McCaffrey, and they run for 40. I know. I know. I mean, it's, it's, I mean I'm mean, i not trying to make it out to be easy, but it certainly is easier <laughs> when you could just throw short passes. You have these elite athletes making plays for you. It's, it's pretty wild when you can talk about having interchangeable quarterbacks almost, plugging them into it the is. system. When you have that many good players on your unit that they can get you to a an adequate level no matter how the quarterback may play. It's 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 well, nuts. And they've also been able to keep those players around because, especially now, they're not paying a quarterback, right? So you mm-hmm. can spend a lot of money on all these different positions to build around your quarterback because you're not paying that quarterback a lot Very true. Very true. All right, 201-939-4513. Let's get to your calls here. But first, make sure that you go and subscribe to the Giants Huddle Podcast. It features long-form interviews with Giants players, coaches, and front office staff, past and present. Plus, hear from the best analysts covering Big Blue in the NFL. Search for the Giants Huddle and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or go to Giants.com slash podcast. And don't forget, if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star positive review for the huddle, for Big Blue Kickoff Live, whatever Giant podcast you're listening to. We just started our player interview series, by the way, in the Giants Huddle Podcast. Go last week, I interviewed Daniel Jones and Tyrod Taylor. I think I got a couple things out of Daniel that we haven't heard before, which is quite the feat. <laughs> He, he does not like to say a lot. I tried. He does not. I hope I got a couple good answers out of him from you. I thought Tyra Taylor actually gives a couple interesting answers. We know that he likes country music. He does. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. <laughs> at something else while he's listening to country music. Um, and uh, I believe today offensive tackles are going up. Correct, Dom? So I, I talked to Evan Neal, Andrew Thomas, and uh, your boy Matt Parrott. So, and um, 
Uh, Marcus McFadden is in that interview as well. I, uh, Marcus um, McKeithen, sorry. I advise you folks to listen to P.J. Fleck. I, yes, that one posted yesterday, uh, last week as well. That huddle was fun. Yeah, that was Lance and I with uh, he, P.J. Fleck, by the way, is the Minnesota Golden Gopher head coach. Mm-hmm. We talked to him about John Michael Schmidt, so I thought that was a good one. He is a, a former Rutgers assistant, and you can see he's got some jersey in him. He's a fun guy to talk to. Agreed. The 2023 NFL schedule is officially out, and sin and single game tickets are on sale now. Don't miss the Giants at MetLife Stadium this season. Visit Giants.com slash tickets to secure your seat today. All right, let's get to the calls now at 201-939-4513 and lead off with Cliff in New York. Cliff, you're first on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hi, Cliff. Hey, guys. How you doing? Good to hear you today. What's well, uh, about Yeah, about the 49ers. You know, years ago when they hired Lynch, I was like, oh, no. You know, I was general manager. I said, I just thought he was going to be really good in that job, and I don't think he's disappointed. I had so much respect for him as a competitor mm-hmm. when he played. And hey, uh, remember, Cliff, though, that doesn't always translate. Like, you have these great players that go and become GMs, and they, it can be absolute disaster sometimes. But, Matt Millen but comes to mind. But Lynch has done a nice job. 100% right. He's done great. Yeah. And uh, as far as matching up with them, um, you know, I think of matching up with them in the same way as matching up with the Eagles and we get, you know, to play 14 games before we have to play the Eagles. Um, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's obviously about how soon we can have a rotation in the trenches that competes with these guys. But in the meantime, when I caught um, the Super Bowl tape, the last Super Bowl, I was just watching the first half a couple of weeks ago, and um, – I was just amazed at what Kelsey did, what Travis Kelsey did. And I'm wondering if, uh, in spite of the fact that we have a long way to go to be on a level with those guys, if Waller might really be able to make a difference uh, oh, yeah. against those teams. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that's why they traded for him. I think Waller's probably more of a vertical player than Kelsey is. Kelsey's probably quicker rather than fast. Waller's probably faster rather than quick. Not that... Kelsey's not also fast and Waller's not also quick, but I think that's how I would kind of delineate their skill sets. But yeah, look, they got Waller because there wasn't a number one wide receiver available that they mm-hmm. thought they could afford, acquire, or wanted to acquire. Mm-hmm. So they got the next best thing, a tight end that's had multiple thousand yard seasons. So yeah, they're going to try to use him in that role and you hope that they can protect long enough to, to get him the ball down the field. Look, you know that Mike Kafka came out of the Kansas City system, right? With Andy Reid over there while he was the quarterback's coach with the Chiefs. He knows all... Yeah all of the different idiosyncrasies that were involved in the tight ends playbook in Kansas City, he's going to wind up using a ton of those here. Waller can do all that stuff. Yep, yep. Well, I was watching the game. I was thinking of what you said about the game too, Paul, because, uh, you know, there was a non-call against Bradbury uh, when the Chiefs were up, when the Eagles were up 14-7 and the Chiefs were driving to tie it, Mm -hmm. and they there was a non-call against Bradbury on a third and long that would have been a, a first down for the Chiefs. And so they had to give it back to the Eagles. And then the Eagles are driving towards midfield, and they get at midfield a, 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 a penalty against the offensive lineman just before the big fumble. Right. And, and I, was, I was thinking, what an incredible turn of events. And it made me think, did they try to make up on the Bradbury no call late in the game? No, I, I don't think so, but I do believe that if the Eagles had to do it all over again, they would admit that they pretty much fritted that game away. Oh, yeah, I mean, they had three turnovers in that game. And, and, I mean. And that's just, if, if that bad snap and fumble, oh, there wasn't a snap, but that fumble by Hurts where he just drops the ball doesn't happen, the Eagles probably win that game. Yeah, it, 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 sh- it should not have come down to the Bradbury play at the end, which, by the way, if you saw the NFL films, did you ever get to see that, John? A week after the game was over, NFL films does their, their half-hour cut-up. I did see it. They had an angle. And, and, yeah. and he clearly held. Yeah, I mean, Bradbury. it was more obvious than any of the TV angles. NFL films had the angle where it showed that he did it. says it on the sideline that he did No it. question. So, you yeah, know, Bradbury. as far as Philadelphia, just button up your mouths on that one because it was obvious. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just quickly about Saquon, <clears throat> it occurred to me, you know, I was listening to him talk about disrespect, and I'm thinking it's not the Giants that are disrespecting him. It's the, it's the, uh, the bargaining agreement, the, the collective bargaining agreement. That's it isn't that either. It's, it's just the market for running backs. 
It's not the CBA. But, but, it's it's the market but, but, for running backs. I was reading. I read an article on a on a site that you guys quote a lot, and it was saying that we're the only sport that has different values assigned to positions, and that in the other sports, it's whoever's playing the best. That's not uh, true. I mean, ba- in baseball, no? center fielders make more money. Starting pitchers make more money. Closers make more money. So I mean, yeah. I mean, in, oh. in basketball, like a dominant. Wing player is a lot more important than a, than than the shorter point guard or a defensive minded center. So absolutely, other uh, other sports pay yeah. more by position. I'm with John. Yeah, I, I can't agree with the been, premise. I can't agree with that premise. But it's not it's not regulated that way. No, oh, no, no. You're right. No, the NFL is the only sport. Well, it's, it's also the only sport that actually has a franchise tag. Well, that's so, that's the problem. Yeah. The the tag requires certain positions to be capped at certain numbers because of the tag. But if there's no tag involved, then there is no restriction on what right. you can pay the guy. Well, you're right, Cliff. The NFL is the only sport that has a tag system yes. based on position. That yes. is correct. That yes. is true. Also, also, it's the tag part that's the regulation. Yes, yes. Okay. correct. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm feeling pretty good about my team, man. I, 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 you should. I, 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 I know that Babel and Shane are not thinking, you know, like like I do as a fan where, you know, well, as long as we can win more games than we lose again, that will be great. And if it, yeah, if it goes to 8-9, that will be all right. They're not thinking that way at all. <laughs> they don't – I don't think they care if they if, – you know, when we were five and one and six and two last year, I said, "Well, this is great, but I really don't want to take this team to the Super Bowl." They would. You yeah, know? of course. <laughs> Thank you, Cliff. <laughs> All right, appreciate Cliff. the call, man. Good stuff. Look, and I think you know he started off the call with the 49ers, and I'll just go back to there for a second. And look, I know a lot can happen between now and then, but Nick Bosa is going to line up over Evan Neal in that game. Mm-hmm. You want an early like? Hello. You know, he's going to get Demarcus Lawrence and Micah Parsons in week one after what we saw in that matchup last year. That's going to be another, let's see what kind of progress Evan Neal made. And then mm-hmm. two weeks later, Nick Bosa, how you doing? That's going to be a really big test. And then you have their interior guys, Javon Hargrave and stuff against the Giants guards and center. So it's going to be a, a very steep early test for that Giants offensive line against Dallas in week one and San Francisco in week three, two of the best fronts in the conference. Thank goodness for Arizona in the middle. That's all I've got to say. You could get a little bit of a breath there. Yeah, don't let Brian Dable hear you say that. Though. No, of course not. Of course not. <laughs> no, but yes, 100%. The quality of the front seven is not there in uh, Arizona. I, mean, I think just quality of the roster. The, the, <laughs> you go right ahead and say that. <laughs> regardless of position, <laughs> I think it's fair to say. Yes, sir. Yeah, the Cardinals are going to have the Cardinals. Let me put it this way. Do you remember what happened a few years ago when the Cardinals drafted Josh Rosen and the next year they got the first overall pick oh, and they drafted Kyle Murray? Wow. Well, there's a chance we could be having a similar conversation uh, next April. It's a mess. It's a mess in Arizona. And if they're sitting there staring at Caleb Williams, oh boy. Kyler Murray might know what it feels like to be Josh Rosen. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Huh? It's not impossible. Ch- chalk up another one of the guys who I didn't like coming out of the draft. He said, Paul, besides the injuries, had a pretty good first couple of years um, in the league. Not a fan. I understand, but you can't say he hasn't had a very good couple first years in the league. His uh, his work ethic and dedication okay. is an issue. That That's fine. You can't say he hasn't had a good first couple of years in the league. He, he had some production. I can't dispute some okay. of the production, but... Well, you, you, have, you can't dispute any production. The production's the production. You can't yeah, but when you, when you take a guy that high, he's got to be all no, in. I understand that. I got you. So, anyway. 201-939-4513. Hugo in New Jersey's up next. Hey, Hugo. Hey, good afternoon, guys. What's up? Hey, um, you know, we've had a lot of discussions in the offseason about the, the wide receiver depth and, and the numbers there and who might stay and who might go. And I'm wondering if we actually have a little more flexibility than what's been uh, talked about. And sort of the way I'm thinking about it is, you know, last year on the 53-man roster, we kept uh, Cam Brown and Carter Coughlin, who are really not inside or off-ball linebacker position players, but were kept for special teams. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so as I think about it, why not? Call Jeff Smith a special teamer, right? Because he's a he's a gunner and he's got speed and he can get. The, he's a he, he's a he's a. I think part of the reason why we signed him is he's a core special teams player, mm-hmm. or could be. And then yeah, I'm not sure call, though he would be as as big on kick coverage and kick return as the Carter Coughlin's and Cam Browns would be though. 
Those guys play okay. all four well, special teams, which is a little well, bit different. Well, well, that that played into my thinking as well, given the rule change, where maybe you're looking for a slightly different profile for your special teams guys and than you have historically. That point you just made is the question that I have yet to figure out. That's and I don't good. think Thomas McGahee has figured it out either. That's a good point. Because what do you now need from your, quote, key core special teams guys now that they've changed the rules here's the problem i don't know the answer to that teams if they see you have a weak coverage team they can return anything they want it's not like they have to take touchbacks no 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 you you certainly cannot strip your your roster void of of any size or any strength and just say we're going to go all with speed guys and we're going to ignore hitters or blockers you can't do that so hugo i guess the question i'd ask you then is how many wide receivers do you think they could keep well, I, I, I'm thinking seven, but uh, that's, that's I mean, could, possible. We, could, could 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 we see something crazy and have them go eight? I, here's Oof, a question: No, I have for you guys can't go eight. Here's Eight's out. Can't go eight. Seven. I, I still think seven's out. too high. But yeah, but we've seen seven before. It could happen. We've seen it before. It's it rare. Last year, yeah. yeah. I mean, it happened last year. Oh. We had two guys uh, taking up roster spots mm-hmm. to be special teamers. What, one question I had for you guys. Yeah. Jeez, it, it's been a. It's been a while since Sterling Shepard's rookie year, but I do recall, wasn't he a, re, a punt return at Oklahoma yes. and during his, his rookie year? They're, not, not, they're not going back to that. No, oh, that they're not? No. So, uh, I mean, so if I'm thinking returner, it, it, okay, all right. Well, well that's because I, I thought maybe. Um, I could see them maybe know, trying Jalen Hyatt as a punt Shepard. returner. Like, I wouldn't be surprised you see Jalen They try to work Jalen Hyatt as a punt returner. That wouldn't shock me. Mm-hmm. He didn't do it in college, but he certainly has a skill set for it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Eric Gray well, maybe I'm, could be in the, the mix for punt return, too. I, I, I guess in, in my mind, I like all these guys a lot. I'm trying to make room for them on the roster. No, I hear Look, look, why, look. Hugo wide receiver is going to be tough and you know whether or not Colin Johnson can can be a vice guy on punts or be a gunner on punts that could determine whether he makes it how important is it that Jamison Crowder is a punt returner on the roster that's something that that's right right. that's That's going to be a big deal so you know there's going to be a lot of guys for limited spots but with the expanded practice squad too like unless look if Colin Johnson doesn't blow up in the preseason let's say he's a quiet couple preseason games there's a good chance you can get him onto the practice squad Mm mm-hmm Right. Well, because because you know what he, he's. If you think about the skill set, he. If, if for some reason I say Hodgins went down, Colin Johnson would be the the uh, obvious replacement. Oh, no, and, least, and look, and know. that's the thing. Like I almost set this up, yeah. Hugo, and I apologize for interrupting you. I I set this up yeah. in silos, right? Like Isaiah Hodgins is your starter, Colin yeah. Johnson's his backup. Right. Darius exactly. Slayton's the, the starter, and Jalen yeah. Hyatt is his backup, right? And then you have the slot guys. You have Paris Campbell and Sterling and Wandell. So I kind of slot it by almost positions within the position. You have the bigger, slower guys, and I don't mean to call them slow, but the bigger the bigger guys, you have the speed guys, and then you have the slot guys. And that's kind of – I have them kind of siloed off in those different roles. Mm-hmm. Well, it's going to be a very, very interesting summer. Oh, and you know what? I hope injury doesn't really take care of it. I want to see it come down to competition. Yeah, no, 100%. Okay. Thank, thank you, Hugo. Well, very good, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. And look, wide receiver is going to be tough. We've talked about it a bunch. Look, I think we'd all be shocked if, you know, let's put Shepard and Wandell aside for now. Yeah, I you think, have to. I think Shepard's going to be ready based on what we saw him doing in the spring. He I'm was, not going there yet, but... He was non-committal you know. about it, so I'll be non-committal about it, too. Mm-hmm. So let's take Wandell and Shep, and let's push them aside for a mm-hmm. second, right? Let's assume you can start them on pup. All right? You're still looking at guys you know are on the roster, right? Isaiah Hodgins, Paris Campbell, Darius Slayton, Jalen Hyatt. Mm-hmm. So that's four. Automatic. Before you even get to Sterling Shepard and Wandell Robinson, okay? Mm-hmm. Then after that... You're getting into the Wandells. You're getting into the Sterling Shepherds, who, if they're healthy, they're obviously on the roster. Um, and then you're looking at the Colin Johnsons of the world. You're looking at the Jameson Crowders of the world. And I feel like I'm even forgetting somebody. Well, Smith, he mentioned Smith. Jeff Smith, if, if, I feel like there's someone else that I'm missing. If he's into the I'm special not. teams, yeah. you know, uh, there's, you know, they gave a lot of money to Ford Wheaton as an undrafted rookie free agent. You don't know how that's going to play out. Yeah, I would think more practice squad for him. But, yeah, no, he's he's certainly in the mix. Um yeah, and there's just, you know, oh, Sills. a lot of guys. David Sills is another guy. He's That's more right. of a practice squatter. But, yeah, him. look, it's it's a lot of guys. 
It's a lot of guys. The back end of the wide receiver depth chart has been improved dramatically. Now, they didn't get the, quote, 1,000-yard receiver at the top, but that's they went out and got Waller, okay? So they said, okay, we're going to we're gonna get the 1,000-yard tight end, and then we're going to take the rest of that receiver room, and we're going to upgrade it. And that's really what they did, and there's nothing wrong with that. It makes the cuts tough, though. Yeah, they look, they... It's the old they they threw numbers at the problem, right? Mm-hmm. Because they didn't have the ability to add that one right. star player, right? It is what it is. 201-939-4513. Hey, Giant fans, take your fandom to the next level with a season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2023 season. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. And the Giants official connected TV streaming app, Giants TV, brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to big blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. I haven't talked to Len in Columbia, Maryland, and I feel like a month. Len, what's going on, man? Hey, how you doing, guys? Doing well. Hi. Good, good. Looking forward to chatting with you here for a couple of minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, measurement of the quality of the wide receiver core will be, will be determined by who's not on the roster rather than who is on the roster. There are some guys who are just, I think, are getting pushed off the roster. Yeah, like it'll be very tough for I think David Sills to be a fifty-three. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. Even a and guy I, like Mickens has been in this league for a few years. Yeah, he's a six-year guy. People don't realize that. Yeah, I, he's been around. He's got some pelts on his belt, so to speak. But I see it being a very tall uphill battle for him to no, make it. And Len, I, I think to your point, you're you're thinking about guys that maybe two years ago would have been the third or fourth wide receiver. Now they're going to have trouble making the roster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. yeah. Not let, me, let me let me throw one other name out there along with David Sills, and that's Colin Johnson. I, I understand your silo thing, John, but I, I just I don't see him in top six. I, I just don't. Why? Even without one day, even without one day. Well, Len, I, I'm going to throw something at you, right? Yeah, yeah. At this time last year, Colin Johnson was a much better NFL player than Isaiah Hodgins. Mm-hmm. And he was drafted the same year as Isaiah Hodgins, and he was drafted around earlier. Than Isaiah Hodgins. Okay, um, he I just has that. I, I understand you. Yeah, he he just he just hasn't had the opportunity to to show it in a regular season game yet. But heading, I mean, it's 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 not an opinion; it's a fact. Isaiah Hodgins at this time last year had zero NFL production, and I mean zero NFL production. And Colin Johnson had a decent amount of NFL production. You know what, Len? The good news well, for well, Colin Johnson is that he's very inexpensive. Yeah. He hasn't yeah, put yeah. a lot on tape, yeah. which means practice squad is a very realistic possibility. Yep. And if you can keep him in the building, it's to your benefit. And I see, Len, I would rather, and even though Jameson Crowder has a much... Uh, bigger resume, and he has had a lot of success in this league, and I know he has punt return experience. Especially against the Giants. 100%. When he was with Washington, he killed the Giants. But given the number of other slot players on this roster, mm-hmm. I would be more apt to keep a Colin Johnson than a Jamison Crowder just because of roster fit. Now, what that could come down to is what do they decide to do on the return game? Correct. That if could they be the decide Crowder's sure. the return guy, then he's got to stay. Then that's a different conversation. Yeah. You got you got to be able to run a wide receiver. That that's not Colin Johnson. I mean, do you think I mean, Isaiah Hodgins is really he fast? Just he he just, well, he's he's faster than Johnson, John. I'm gonna go forty yard dash times. Honest, I honestly don't know which guy ran Len, faster. Len yeah. Johnson Johnson uh, is a long strider, so you're right. He doesn't have great quicks, but Isaiah he, Hodgins ran a four six one. 40-yard dash at the NFL Combine, and Colin Johnson ran a, let's see. <laughs> He's a long strider. Here? He ran. That, that's the bottom uh, line. He did not run at the Combine. Let's see if he had a he pro is a, day. He is a long strider. He, at his Texas Pro Day, he must have been hurt during that college offseason. I think he had I, a hamstring, John. I do not see a 40-yard dash time for him. But the bottom, Hodges, okay. Hodges ran a 4-6-1. I guarantee you Colin okay. Johnson wasn't well off of that. All right. Coming off an injury, too, right? 
100. percent Oh look, Glenn, I'm not trying to tell you Colin Johnson's okay. going to win the starting look, job here and catch 80 yeah, yeah, Okay. All, all right, the all things right, you're right. saying all may right. be a better reason for them to be able to stash him. And it wouldn't surprise me if he's on the practice squad. There's, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I mean, uh, John's right. case is I'll, I'll you want him point. in the building, right? You want him all in the building. Right. Well, I, I want one other guy that can be that big-bodied wide receiver to be Hodgins's quarterback. You don't have to sell me. I know. And 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 honestly, Len, I'm biased. Colin Johnson yeah. is an awesome dude. I'm friendly with he him, and I really dude. want yeah, him yeah, to yeah. make it. So I'm I'm, yeah. I'm admittedly biased in this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Let me and let me say this. And you know, we're sitting there. I'm sitting here being critical of Colin Johnson, and the guy is an unbelievable athlete. I mean, they all are. Oh, of course, of course, just, of course. There's just some of them that are better than others. Oh, 100 percent. <laughs> hundred um, percent. Listen, I want to say something about Jamison uh, Crowder. I'm pat myself on the back. John might remember. Uh, John, Paul, too, you might remember this. I really wanted Crowder four years ago. Uh, you, you know, one day, he was killing us on the Redskins, and he, he was a darn good receiver. He signed with the Jets, mm-hmm. and, and I, I just really wanted him four years ago. I thought that would have been a great signing for us. Hey, let me say something about the 49ers. That's going to be a tough game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Headline. <laughs> headline. Um, hey, look, and Len, look, by the look, way. I, or, I, got that one, I, I got that one circled. I, I think there's three games on this schedule. Y- you know, we got to get at least two of them. Um, that opening night against the Cowboys, division rival at home, opening day, that 49er game, and that first Eagle game, uh, what is it? The day after Christmas, uh, you know, the day after Christmas. Is that, that home or road? No, no, it's, it's the, one, it's yeah, the yeah, 25th. Away, away, the away. 25th is Christmas. Yeah, the, yeah, 20, yeah, the 25th on the road. I, I see that. You want I mean, two that, of those that three? Keeps us, that game keeps us in the race or kicks us out well, of the Well, then I will tell you, if the Giants win two out of those three games, they're going to be a playoff team. Yeah. Okay, good. I want them. Well, but I will right, say this. Even if they lose two out of three, they can still be a playoff game. Well, I know. Because that is a real I got those circles. And you know, I'm I'm with, but Paulie, I'm I'm with. Well, I think I'm with Paul on this. Maybe, I, I forget which one of you guys said this earlier in the show when talking about Brock Purdy. I'm 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 of the wait and see. I'm in the wait and see category. Yeah, that was me. Um, that was me. Look, he he was the what, what was he the 256 last pick <laughs> pick in the draft. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, he doesn't do anything spectacular that these defensive coordinators and defensive coaches. And defensive players aren't going to be able to figure out. The I weaponry mean, in the scheme is incredibly advantageous to whoever's taking snaps for San Francisco. I will Francisco. say this. He's smart, oh, and yeah. he's smart, and he's a quick processor. He gets, mm-hmm. he, yeah. he gets yeah. rid of, for a rookie especially. He And look, he played yeah. four full years at Iowa State. It makes sense. He's an older rookie. But he, he's very good, Lennon, getting the ball out quickly and making good decisions. Now, like, guys yeah, are yeah. open all over the place, which makes it easier, mm-hmm. but he still does yeah. manage to do that within the advanta- advantageous situation around him. And what do they always yeah. tell you about young quarterbacks? If you can avoid mistakes, you're a leg up on the competition. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you know that 44-10 that, that to 10 game you referred to, Paulie, I mean, to, boy, boy, talk about a nightmare. That yeah, was, oh, it was a nightmare. Was but, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, they were... Um, uh, they played the Jets the week before mm-hmm. at MetLife. That's right. Uh, to spend a week up at a resort in West Virginia, and came back uh, to Giants to uh, yeah, you know came back to MetLife anxious to get home with a win, and they really laid it to us. Who do they just off the top of your head? And let's not look this. I don't want to waste your time doing this. But who do, who do they play the week before? Do you, you know off the top of your head? The Niners? Yeah. Are they on the road or are they home that week? You, you, mean, you mean this year when we play the 49ers? Yeah, yeah. No, no when, we, when we played them on Thursday, where are they on the previous Sunday? That's All right, hold on. Really I got the schedule right in front question. of me. You got that handy, Paul? Yeah, yeah. All right, they play uh, the Rams. <laughs> it's a road game, but it's not really yeah, a road no, I mean, game. It's, it's, it's right there. <laughs> yeah, it's not really a road game. I'll tell you what, though, that is, yeah, yeah no, that's not really a road game. No, right, it's so, not really so a road down game. In L- they're down at, they play the Rams in L.A.? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. I was just curious. You know, just curious. Hey, let me ask you something about the defensive backs. You got time to take yeah, the question? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, we got time. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you six givens, okay? And you tell me who the other guys are. Um, yeah, you, know, you know, we'll start with Jackson, uh, Banks, and Flott. And we'll go to safety and uh, keep Belton, McKinney, obviously, 
and okay, let's let's put Pinnock on that list. So okay. we got six. I agree. I think all those six we're, guys are on the roster. Yes, I'm mm-hmm. with you on that. We're, we're, who are the who are the who, who are the other four? I mean, where do we? You know, who are the who are the boundary guys? Who who's the first guy off the bench on the boundary? I think it's Oruwari way, and it's Oruwari way. By the way, I talked to him about that from the Lions. Okay. I think he's okay. a guy that fits. They're going to keep yeah. McLeod. I think he's a boundary guy, and I think Nick McLeod's on the roster too as a corner safety hut. Mm-hmm. So I think those two okay, guys yeah, are on yeah. for sure. So I All think right. that's All eight. Right. Now, if if you got that, do do you go to a fourth safety, or do you or do, is McLeod your kind of the swing guy? I think McLeod's you can... your fourth safety. Okay. Could turn okay. out to be that way. I mean, I mean, and there's always you a got, chance Owens, your draft pick, makes the roster. Did you too. mention I mean, McCain? There's always a chance of that. Yeah, Bobby McCain's another one. He's a safety corner hybrid, Paul. That's a really good one. He's going to be on the roster. Well, 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 he signed up for a reason. Okay, he'll so, be here. So maybe it's McCain. So maybe it's McCain and McLeod battling for that. Uh, you know, the no, no. Kind of the I don't think it's a battle thing. land. I think both guys make the team. Yeah, I think so too. Oh wow. Len, I would not yeah. be surprised with the way Winks likes to use safeties that you see a, an, an, a very large number of defensive backs on this final roster. Mm-hmm. Well, you think there's more than 10? I'm thinking. This more is me than thinking. 10? One, two, three, yeah. four. That's well, a you, lot. You were already Six, talking. Seven, I mean, eight. I could see nine. I don't think 10. Well, then I'm not sure if McLeod and... Oh, oh, there, you there you go. There you go. It gets tight. See, you know, you know where, where it gets a little sticky? The economics yeah. involving Darnay Holmes. <clears throat> there oh, are yeah. people, there are people who are sure because of his cap number that he's got to go to create some more room this year because they will need some flexibility during the season to have yeah. a few bucks. I'm not in that camp. I believe right now Darnay Holmes, as inconsistent as he's been, is still their most accomplished slot guy. Right now, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, yeah. I mean McCain, yeah. McCain has more. He's NFL done some experience doing it. Yes, yeah. but for the Giants, for the Giants, Holmes, Holmes is yes, the most correct. guy. To me, until somebody proves to me during camp in the preseason that they can at least perform at Holmes's level, I don't see him being cut. That doesn't mean he can't be, because again, there is a business side to this, and they may desperately need that money. So yeah. that, to me, is where that extra DB may or may not come in. That's a good point. Listen, I think, Wink, I think Wink really likes Holmes. And the one, thing, the one thing that I like about Holmes, he gets people on the ground. No, he tackles. Absolutely. He does. He does. If he, he does. gets his hands on you, if he gets his hands on you, you're going down. No, he's physical. And, and you know that, 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 that corner from Detroit, that corner from Detroit, Six two two oh five. It's hard to cut six two two oh five. Oh no, I, that, that's why I think. Well, look, Glenn, they, they don't have a lot of accomplished outside corners. That's why I think he's on the roster. I'd yeah, be shocked now, if he's not on the roster. Well, now and the one name we haven't mentioned, and we can move on pretty quickly, is Aaron Robinson. And by the way, how about Trey Hawkins? And you got the rookie. Yeah. yeah. So I know you're right, Len. Maybe we haven't talked about the defensive backfield enough, but there's going to be a heck of a competition there. You're right. You know, Aaron yeah, Robinson, just so you know, even in the media portions of the spring, which everybody saw, so I'm not giving out any secrets here, he was on the side. Yeah, he wasn't ready to go. You know, he, he's still not ready after significant, okay. significant okay. knee surgery. Okay. Mm-hmm. He was not ready to do anything. Yeah, I, I don't, could see him being on pup to start. I could easily sure. see him start Absolutely. out on okay. pup, mm-hmm. which hey, would me... save you a spot with him. And we didn't mention hey, Darius Williams that either, by the way. Just FYI. I know, and I've always uh, liked him, but I just don't know. that. I don't think he's got a I, chance. I don't know. I think it's no, an, I don't, I don't I think think it's an uphill I, battle for sure. It is. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, let me ask you a quick question um, about A. Sean Robinson. Yeah. Was he was he active at all d- during OTAs? Yeah, a little bit. Oh, he okay. did some stuff. Sure. I, I some think stuff. That's, you know, I think that's an underrated signing. I, that's a good signing, Len. Absolutely. Oh, I'm with you. Oh, my goodness. This is a professional football no, player. He's a good player. He, He's, he's big. a starter. I mean, this is a starter, an NFL starter. He was a starter on a Super Bowl championship team. He's a big guy. Uh, I, I tell you, opposite Leonard Williams, hand in the ground. And he and, down. And, Not many teams are going to – listen, with Williams and Robinson on the outside and the big guy in the middle – I'm telling you, not many teams are going to run on and the And Len, Giants, even no. better, when Dex is off the field, he can play nose. Mm-hmm. So you yeah. have your nose when Dex, you know, you don't have to play Dex 85% of the snaps anymore because you have a guy you can put in there at nose. Now, Aishon has yeah. to stay healthy. He's had some injury issues over the course he of has. the last few years of his career. But look, I, he, I'm with you. I think the Aishon signing is huge. You know, an underrated injury last year was the Nick Williams yeah. injury. 
who yeah, was, yeah. I thought was really going to be an important run stopper for them. Oh, he yeah. got hurt earlier in the year, and they never really replaced him. And Ashawn Robinson's a better player than Nick Williams. So oh, I think I it's think a so. very, oh, very sure. good signing. I think it's a terrific signing. Oh, really to re- no. he's going to be a, he, he's really going to be a difference maker i mean he's not going to do anything flashy but um, not many teams are going to run on the giants hey listen you you gave me a lot of time i appreciate yeah. it guys no problem hey, we'll talk soon let's Thank talk you, soon hey and 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 the good part of these shows in in july and june we have time for we don't get a ton of calls so if you want to come and make longer points That's this true. is the time to have longer in the weeds conversation so it's John, all good. the defensive line for me is really a uh, a question of efficiency because if you're able to give some more snaps to a Robinson or a DJ Davidson coming off of an injury or a a progressing Ryder Anderson or Nacho. And you have Nacho too. Yeah, right? Or Nacho. Him. If any of these guys can give you productive snaps. And by the way, Vernon Butler has been a good defensive tackle in the league for a long time. He has. I don't know what he's got here because we need to see him in camp in preseason mm-hmm. games. But if he does have something off for holy smokes now. What you're talking about is alleviating some of the load off Dexter and Leonard Williams Mm -hmm. to the point where their efficiency quotient might actually go up if they're able to play a few less snaps. I'm with you. And and that is a win-win all around. So that's the mysterious part for me right now, is how much better and more dominant can they be on their snap allotment if you're able to give them more of a rest? I just don't know. They could be, or their or their production know. might go down because they have fewer snaps to do it too. But their efficiency might go up. To That's, your point, yes, yeah, I think it's a good question. Now we didn't necessarily see Dexter Lawrence slow down in fourth quarters of games last year. We did not. He, in fact, he had some really big game changing fourth quarter plays. I suspect because last year was his full breakout year. I mean, he took his game. Oh, he was a monster. Another mm-hmm. notch and a half up. Teams are going to have a lot more planned for him this year. Than even they did the second half of last season. And I, he, Dex got, I got two things. One, they, Dex got mad at me, or not, not mad, but I could tell he was a little annoyed when I did our player interviews. I asked him, I go, so Dex, you know, I was really impressed how the scheme this year, you know, I thought they got you more one on one matchups than usual when they got you isolated <laughs> on centers. He goes, you didn't think I got double teamed? I go, no, I'm not saying you didn't get double teamed. But I'm saying, like, Dex, in that game Good against job, the Vikings. Good job, John. Thanks. But I'm like, in that game, in those two games against the Vikings, how much did he get one-on-one against Bradbury? It was a lot. And that's the point I was trying to make by Wink. And look, this is when we talk about blitzing. Right? We talked about this on the show before. Mm-hmm. You blitz to create free runners, but you also blitz to create one-on-one opportunities. Yes. And when Wink blitzes a lot, you don't have the extra blockers to double team somebody. So that gets Dexter more one on one pass rush situations. He wouldn't get mad at me if he wants. <laughs> he was kind of laughing at me. It wasn't bad. But uh, you- you'll hear it. That'll be on sometime middle of July. But I thought they did a good job getting on one on ones. And when you have this scheme, when you're sending five or six guys, it's really difficult to double team players. That's why I always call the game a spider web. Yeah. Because so much is intertwined and one thing leads to another and leads to another and another thing. And You know, that's why Ojolari and Tibbs have to be able to stay on the field. Both of these guys have been dinged up Mm -hmm. since they've been here. You need both of those guys on the field because it will make a difference. People have to pay attention to both edges. Yeah, it it means the world. The other note I have from my player interviews, and I'll reference these along the way. And yes, all the full episodes will be up throughout July. We're going offense and defense. You have to be patient, folks. <laughs> this this is carrying us through all of July now, mind you. So we had to spread them out a little. There bit. There is a lot of time to go. And by the way, no sh- no shows next week. By the way, the office is closed. It's off closed this Friday too. Some Friday. Through the following Friday, no BBKs, just FYI, so keep that in mind. So in the Darnell Holmes interview that I did, yes, I asked him what he worked on in the offseason without me prompting him for an right. answer. He goes, um, playing defense without my hands more. So he, he, was, knows. he, was, he was told, and he knows, mm-hmm. that he was way too handsy last year. He goes, look, it was the first time I really played slot for a full year. When I got a little, you know, when I got a little nervous in the secondary and the guys were getting separation, I would grab. Mm-hmm. And I know I can't do that. So he... Came out flat and said, look, that's something I'm working hard at specifically to be better at this year. He led the Giants in penalties last year. Yes, he did. And in some big situations in the games. He did. And that's the big thing that he's working on this offseason, not committing those penalties. You know, John, I made a comment on the show last week. I don't know if you were with me. 
Um, that's what I liked about what I saw from Deontay Banks during the spring drills because there's no contact allowed yes. because of the CBA. Well, it's funny. I asked Darnay. I'm like, so Darnay, the, the fact that you can't touch guys in the spring, does that he goes, yeah, it actually gives me good reps because yes. I'm not allowed to touch anybody. Because you have to be mindful of shadow skills are critical. Yeah. You can't you can't do anything else in, in the spring. All you can do is match. You can't. Shadow skills. Correct. That's it. Mm -hmm. And to me... That's why I was impressed with Deontay Banks because, I, I look, he did get beat a few times, sure, but he also made a number of plays sure. and showed me that he can utilize his shadow skills without being physical because we all talk about his size, mm -hmm. his length. Sure. He's got a little bulk on him. He's going to be a physical boundary corner. He didn't have to be to make plays in the spring, and that's good. Paul, this is fun. It's good to be back. Yeah, it was. Oh, tell me about it, John. We still got a few more weeks to go, but... It's okay. We have, we have good shows planned. That's the beauty of it. With all these opponents' previews that we do, the summer previews, and you know, you've know you got so much of the stuff to put up on the huddle, we hope the Giants fans are still have enough to chew on for the next month or so. Yeah, tomorrow it's Lance and Paul. They got the Bills, and Lance and I have the Cardinals on Wednesday. And tomorrow, tomorrow, I'm not letting the cat out of the bag here, tomorrow I believe the league – if not all the teams are going to announce their training camp schedules. Oh, okay. I believe that's a league-wide uh, announcement coming out tomorrow for everybody. So stay tuned for that, folks. For Paul DeTino, I'm John Schmelt. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Big Blue Kickoff Live. Thanks to Dom. We'll see you next time.